Hey everyone, in today's teaching, we are going to look at something really cool within Jesus' discipleship group. The Hebrew word is Talmudim. And there is something that was hiding in plain sight for so many years that I never saw. It is electric and it's going to give you a whole new perspective on something Jesus was up to during his life and his ministry. Friends, hello there and welcome to another episode in the teaching series. We are going to have a ton of fun today because I want to talk to you about a few different people groups during the time of Jesus, who they were and what they were like. And to help us out today, I've got my four kids along with five of Mark Nogler's kids. So Mark is actually behind the camera right now. He is my new creative director at Walking the Text. He and his family just moved from Florida to the greater Nashville area to join us at Walking the Text. We're super excited because he's behind the camera. Let me show you a picture here of what he looks like. Now Mark and his wife Tanya have eight kids. I know, I thought I had a lot with four kids. They've got eight. Three of the older ones are still back in Florida. But their five kids that are here and my four kids are all going to help us today. So I'm going to have the first five come out right here. So Ariah, Calix, Zoe, Zyler, and Naomi. You guys are going to be my fishermen today. So go ahead and snag this net right here. And let's talk about the fishermen in the first century world. These are our blue collar hard-working people who are fishing during the night because fishing was typically done during the night so that the fish could be sold fresh in the market in the morning. And so these are the ones that are working really hard to provide the food for the people, particularly around the Sea of Galilee. All right, another group. We're going to have Hannah come help us here. Hannah is going to be our tax collector. Now, we're going to have to take a little bit more time to explain our tax collector. But in the first century world, like today, you have to pay taxes. And there are two places that your taxes go. The first place, if you're a good Jew, is to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. You would pay the annual tax to the temple, which was due in the springtime, you would also pay a tithe on your crops. That was to the temple. But Rome is ruling the world at this time, and so you pay taxes to Rome as well. Now there's what we call a direct tax, which is a tribute tax that went because you were under the boot of the empire, and the governor of your particular area, or procurator is what they were called, they would be the ones that would collect the direct tax. The indirect tax were taxes on all kinds of other things. And so what the Roman governor or procurator would do is that they would ask a chief tax collector to collect those taxes on behalf of Rome. And how this would work is this, is that the governor would go to a particular area and he would say, okay, here is an RFP, a request for proposal, for those of you who want to take on the role as a chief tax collector. And so someone would stand up and say, hey, I'll give you $7 million for this area. And another person would stand up and say, I'll give you $9 million for the area. Of course, who's going to get the contract? The one who has bid more. And so the governor would say, okay, $9 million, you get the contract. And that chief tax collector was responsible for handing over those funds to the governor, and then over the next year, he would recoup his losses, or what you could say his investment, because a chief tax collector like Zacchaeus, he's our only chief tax collector in the text, would hire underlings, if you will, just called tax collectors. And now it was Naomi, or excuse me, Hannah's responsibility for going out and collecting the taxes. Now, everybody knew that this system was corrupt, that Hannah was corrupt, because Hannah would go and she would exact more taxes than what she was supposed to 
because not only did she have to give the money to her boss, but she had to make a living for herself. And so she would take more than what she was supposed to in order to get the taxes, not only for her pocket, but also for the chief tax collector. And the chief tax collector and the tax collectors were Jewish, exacting taxes from their own people to hand it over to Rome. I am so sorry, but you are among the most hated people in the first century world for the Jewish people. There is our tax collectors. All right, now Denyan and Demarcus are going to represent our third group here. These are our zealots. Now, the zealots in the first century world were religious extremists. They thought the kingdom of God came through force. And they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. And the second greatest commandment for them is you do not commit idolatry. And coins were a form of idolatry because on the coins had the image of Caesar who called himself Lord and God. And so for the zealots, they did not like anybody who was working alongside of Rome. And so even within the zealots, I'm going to borrow this for a moment, Demarcus, there was a subgroup called the Sicarii based on the word sake, which means the curved dagger. I mentioned they were religious extremists. They would come into the marketplace or they would come into an area where they wanted to assassinate someone and they would take this blade, they'd stick it up into their cloak, they'd come walking in, grab from behind the person they want to eliminate, bring out the knife, stab them in the heart, drop them and keep on walking and then all of a sudden everybody would look around and somebody was bleeding out and it was somebody that they wanted to get rid of. These were the zealots. Now, one more. Zach, come join us. So, Zach, you are just going to represent a miscellaneous fourth group. I know it's not a big role, but you look good to handle it. So, all right, now what I want to do is this. is I want to pass out a couple of passages that I'm going to have you read. There we go. And beginning with you, Naomi, please read the passage reference and your passage nice and loud for us, please. Mark 1, 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. All right. Peter and Andrew. All right, Zoe, you read yours, please, nice and loud. Mark 1, 19 through 20. When he had gone a little farther, farther he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. James and John. All right, Araya, read for us John 1, 44 for John us. John 1, 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip, most likely. And here is why. Because Bethsaida was a fishing village. So if it's like Peter and Andrew, then Philip is likely also a fisherman as well. We have at least four, perhaps five fishermen in Jesus' group. All right, Hannah, nice and loud for us, your passage. Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told, them, told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. So now we have Matthew who collects taxes, and tax collectors would do this at either the ports or between regions. Okay, Dinian, read for us your passage, please. Matthew 10, verses 2 through 4. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Simon, the zealot, 
Are you kidding me? Now here's the other thing that's possible is that Judas Iscariot, you're Simon the Zealot, you're Judas Iscariot, is Iscariot is Ish Kiriot in Hebrew. Some people see this as a man of Kiriot, and if this is the case, Kiriot was a zealot hideout 20 miles south of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know this for certain, but we know we at least have one zealot in the group, and we may have a second zealot in Jesus' Talmudim, or his discipleship group. And Zach, you just represent the rest of the disciples. We don't know a whole lot about the others, but you are representing the last set of disciples. Now understand something here. The fishermen did not like the tax collector because the fishermen looked at the tax collector and said, you are corrupt and you're taking more from us than what you are supposed to. The fishermen did not like the zealots because the fishermen thought they were idiots for thinking that the kingdom of heaven comes through force. Now, the tax collector doesn't like the fishermen because the fishermen keep complaining and the tax collector just says, well, just buck up. This is how the world works. And then the tax collector doesn't like the zealots because they have likely assassinated one of their family members, and they fear for their lives because these are religious extremists. And then you have the zealots who do not like the tax collectors because they say it is treasonous for you to do what you are doing. And then the zealots don't like the fishermen because they think they should rise up and revolt against the tax collectors because they're a bunch of wimps. And this is Jesus's Talmudim. Socially, politically, religiously, economically, they could not be more different. And yet Jesus brings them all together and he's like, kumbaya, y'all. And this is what we have. All right. Thank you all for helping me. You guys can head that direction. Awesome. So what are the implications of this? If this is Jesus' discipleship group, what in the world is going on? What is Jesus after? Well, that is what we get in John 17. Listen to these words from verses 20 to 23. Jesus is praying for not only his disciples, he does that in John 17, but he prays for the disciples who are to come, us. And he says this, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You know what this tells us about God and how God assembled Jesus' Talmudim? Is that God is not a God of uniformity. God is a God of of unity. That in the kingdom of Christ, diversity is what God is after. There is a dignity to difference, and diversity is not the aberration. Diversity is actually the expectation that God has created all people differently, and God doesn't want them all to be uniform, but He wants them to be unified. And one of the things that Jesus says here in John 17 is that when my disciples come together in unity, when they become one, they let the world know that I am not a fraud, that my mission is true. And when Jesus assembles his Talmudim, his discipleship group together, I would imagine that they all got into the room that first time and thought, oh my goodness, what kind of social experiment is this? Because they all knew that they were radically different. 
And if Jesus was going to go on and say, as he did in John 17, Father, make them one, my disciples to come, make them one, because then the world will know what my mission is all about. Jesus said, I am going to prove it with my discipleship group first. And Jesus knew that if he could take these guys from all of these radically different backgrounds and different voting and different thoughts and ideas on how things should play out, and if he could bring them to unity, not uniformity, but to unity, Jesus would show that this was possible in any age with any group of people. And friends, where we are at in the world today is that there is all of this brokenness, all of this disunity, all of these things that are going on. And Jesus goes, the church is called to band together, to not be uniform, but to be unified. And as they come together, loving and respecting one another, of all races, of all different backgrounds, of all different ways that they vote, Jesus said, I'm not asking them to be uniform, but what I'm asking them to be is unified. And that comes through love. It comes through respect. It comes in recognizing that Jesus is the one who sits at the center of it all. The goal is to become unified with Christ and to allow him to do things in us and through us to bring his church into unification so that the world may know he is true. And I wonder for us today what that looks like for all of us to grow in our unity, particularly with those who don't look like us. Welcome to Jesus' Talmudim. Well, friends, as always, we have additional questions at Walking the Text that will help you to go further and deeper with an episode like this. I'd highly encourage you to check those out. And we are going to be continuing in our next episode in this series, The Dignity of Difference. And we're going to talk about something that I believe is going to be super helpful and very challenging to us all. But for now, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may you walk out the text well in your life. Thank you.